In today's episode of Handmade, we're visiting a sculptor's studio to see how statues are made. Maybe she'll make a bust of me. Welcome to Handmade, a series about artisans and craftsmen who use their creativity and skills to make unique works of art. In our modern world, it seems like everything is mass-produced, pre-packaged, and available on Amazon. So it's easy to forget that some things are still made by hand. So come on, let's go visit the studio of today's featured artisan. Mary Rudin is an accomplished artist and sculptor who has taught college-level art classes. Her sculptures appear in museums, libraries, and public spaces. That's what makes a, a piece of art valuable. It's the artist's personality, their human touch going into the art. It's not just a photo replica or a 3D printed replica of someone. You have a very extensive background in art and design and have done a lot of illustrations. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you become interested in sculpture? I think I've always been interested in sculpture and I always think of sculpture as the mother arts, that is architecture being the father of the arts and sculpture would be the mother of the arts because it's things in three dimensions. My inner eye, you have to be able to pre-visualize and I think that's the key of a true artist, to pre-visualize what they're going to do and sort of scope it out sort of like an architect doing blueprints for a drawing. Yeah, I, that's the part of, of sculptor that always amazes me is how you can start either with a, a lump of clay and form it into something or start with a piece of wood or a piece of granite and remove material. That's and, right. You know, you, like you said, you have to see pre-see in your mind what mm -hmm. that image is going to look That's like. That's right. And the only tools I use are the ones they've used years ago, like a calipers and uh, things for proportioning, but I don't need anything fancy. And that's the beauty of it. You just do it with your hands. Right. Why did you select historic uh, women as subjects? I think um, it was a goal of mine to illustrate and especially sculpt the historic people of Tennessee, but when I realized there are so many women that are underrepresented and people that are not known, I thought I should step up to that platform and try to give them their sort of day in the sun. Tennessee actually had so many interesting people and many of them happened to be women. What are some of the unique challenges uh, with sculpting historic figures? I'd say one of the challenges, obviously, is that they're gone. They're not here, and a lot of them did not have any surviving photographs, if photography was even around at the time. For instance, the Mary Patton sculpture that I made is from the 1700s, so they, there weren't any pictures around. There were no surviving portraits of her. So you have to do a lot of research, and then the costuming research is extensive. Just like when they're making a movie, um, you have all these costume and fashion experts, and from the detail down to you know the bonnets that they wore, any kind of jewelry or lack thereof, the costuming, the clothing, the shoes, the length of the apron that they wore, all of that is actually very important. And you need to have it accurate because historians are going to criticize you as an artist if you have it making it making it look pretty isn't right. enough you have to be accurate let's head down to your studio so you can show us where the magic happens clay comes in different grades it comes in a hard and a medium and a soft this is the soft which is rather malleable and easy to work with the hard clay is extremely dif difficult to work with it's very hard and the reason for that is you would put that on first onto your armature. You want it to be structural. Remember, you want your sculptures to be able to hold up and survive the journey all the way to the foundry where they'll eventually be made uh, into the bronze pieces. We use different types of hardware cloth or expanded metal. Um, you use different heavy gauge metals knowing that a lot of sculptures will become very heavy when they're finished and then they have to make the journey to the foundry. So you're going to use a thick gauge metal. This is aluminum. Sometimes I use some stainless steel in there, but certainly nothing that's going to rust. And the hardware cloth is going to go on some of this wrapped wire to help give the structural, structural um, shape and to hold it down. 
And as you can see, I use different grades. This is sort of a medium grade, and this is a fine grade. Looks a lot like chain mail that people used to wear. Once you take the hardware cloth and you cut it, I have to use different types of cutters to cut it with because you can actually get cut and uh, it's rather unforgiving. You need to layer it with the clay and that's certainly very strong as you can see. And you add it to your armature and you have to start marrying the pieces together and getting it on there. Now you can understand how a sculptor can actually sculpt a life-size person or a bust of a person and why it doesn't fall apart and get wimpy on you like regular clay. Now this oil-based clay will never dry out so you really don't have to cover it um, unless you're going to let it sit up for months at a time because it's very almost greasy like um, and that's easier for you to work and you can make little changes here and again and I do use a clay warmer when I need to to keep that clay warm. But you can kind of understand the additive process where we're adding clay to the figure. We are building it just like uh, a skeleton that goes underneath the skin. You have to understand the proportions very, very well of the anatomy. I'm a trained artist, so we took anatomy for years in school. We learned all the muscles and the bones. We have to remember uh, the muscles make the facial expression. And what makes a sculpture successful is it's not just a replica of the person you're trying to portray, is, but it has their expression, their personality. Sometimes the, the twinkle in their eye, you can almost feel that. We don't use anything fancy. We use something called a calipers. For instance, luckily, this is Sequoia, the Cherokee Indian that invented the syllabary that's so famous. Because he is so famous, there were several oil portraits made at his time when, when he was alive. And there's some very famous sculptures of him out in Oklahoma. But what I can do to learn from the portraits that have already been made of him, that are his likeness, is I can take proportions off of them and figure out how close his eyes were together. Did he have a long nose? His father was a um, an American fur trader, and his mother was a Cherokee squaw, so um, he will have some American features in him other than the Native American features. So I can take proportions with my caliper, and I can simply enlarge them or reduce them and understand where I've gone wrong. Oh, I've got his nose too short, you know, his mouth isn't wide enough. The, this is just a tool of measurement to help me import those proportions to get his likeness to look real. And I use all kinds of large tools in the beginning. You should always start with the largest tool that you can. And it's, these tools have been around for ages, just sculpted pieces of wood. We use all of these wire tools to sculpt and get the contours um, the way that we want to, to refine the contours. And you see, it's reductive, whereas we're taking things away, just like a marble sculptor they take a giant block of marble and they will reduce it with one of these reducers. Well, I'm also adding, don't forget, because all I've started out with is just a bunch of wires. So this is an additive process as you start adding the clay and then it's a reductive process where you're reducing it to refine it and make it more refined. And luckily, um, with this sculpture, this is Ann Davis, the founder of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And she has never been depicted before in, in portraiture, certainly never a, a bronze bust. And I usually work with a lazy Susan so I can really see all three sides. It's very simple for me to spin it around and work it. You can see how rudimentary this might look, but styrofoam is a wonderful material for us and it comes also in structural grades. This is structural styrofoam that they use in building construction. The rest is just packing styrofoam. And I have to build with, with the metal armature on there, and um, then I put all my hard clay first. As I said before, I'm able to cut it with these tools. And then I put the softer clay to actually give the details. But this is an interesting portrait because I had such high quality black and white photographs of her, and she was a very famous person at that time, of course, in history. So I was lucky enough to have these nice portraits to work of. 
and then in regards to just the refinement of the sculpture, it will take some time, but I want to get her basic features mapped out first, and then I'm going to come in and use my tools to refine and get it to the point where it really does look like her, and then I have to get that expression. I don't want to just create something that looks like it was 3D printed. Then it goes off to the foundry, and that's when the process begins there with the mold making. They'll make a silicone mold directly from my clay model, and it's a platinum silicone mold, so it will pick up every detail. It will even pick up a fingerprint, and it will also be archival, so you can make numerous copies if you needed to. And the silicone mold making process is rather complicated. That's why I take it to a foundry. From that silicone mold, they will start to make um, a mother mold on top of that to give it structure. From the mother mold, then they will uh, remove the clay and they will have to make a parting line. Usually, in a bust like this, the parting line will be here. And that means a seam. For instance, if you're going to make a mold of this, you'll have to get this out of it. And how would you do that? Well, you'll have to cut it, so she will have a parting line probably here, and later on it will be welded and sanded, so no one will know that it was done in, in those pieces. This is one of your more famous statues. Yes, it's um, Mary Patton, an American Revolutionary War hero, and she made all the black powder, which is gunpowder, for the Battle of Kings Mountain, which is well known to be the turning point in the Revolutionary War. And this is exactly how she would have appeared in this kind of working cap and working outfit. And the gunpowder, the raw gunpowder, is being stirred by hand out in the hot sun. And the way we start a sculpture like this is, of course, with the clay. And this is on an armature made of metal. Unfortunately, it has to be dissected and taken apart when you make the mold because you have to think about how you're going to get the mold off of it. And you need to figure out where the parting line is or the seam and even the stick that she was stirring the gunpowder with the cauldron all of the parts they all have to be made separately and they're made in a very high quality mold material this is silicone platinum this is the actual mold it's so sensitive that it actually will pick up a fingerprint this is rather soft and flimsy, and that's why it picks up the detail. So therefore, it needs the mother mold, which is a fiberglass and other types of materials mixed in. And again, you can see that this mother mold has a parting line or a seam, and there's these bolts that hold it together. You've heard the expression, oh, that person is so funny, he's broken the mold. Well, all of that comes from sculpture, nomenclature. Um, this mold will be literally broken open, then eventually in the foundry they would turn this thing upside down and pour the mold making material which is a type of a resin with bronze powder in it and they put it on a spinner and it's gyrated many hundreds of times to make sure that there is no air bubbles and that it makes full contact with the mold and all the details will be properly represented and then of course you have your finished piece and then you need to apply the patina. Patina is the Italian word for paint it's not paint like uh, Sherwin-Williams or something, but it's a type of a paint that's rubbed on and buffed and so on. And then you put a final coat of wax to protect it from oxidation and uh, to give it a little bit of a gloss. Sculpture is always best when you can walk around it, and that's how it should always be displayed, not jammed up against a wall. You can sort of experience that time in history and understand what, what the person's trying to show. Your statues appear in museums and libraries and public spaces. Uh, what's the application or bidding process like? That's an excellent question. It took me many years to even qualify to do what we call public art, but you have to have been recognized and have had solo shows, been an award-winning artist, have had jury exhibitions and that sort of thing, and your work has to be really up to par because you're bidding against people from any part of the country. For example, for the City Hall uh, mm -hmm. bust, how many artists would apply for that? I think it, it can just depend. It might be a hundred, it might be a thousand, and wow. it might only be fifty. But you have to meet the criteria and then it's repetition. If you've done something like that before, they'll feel confident that you can handle this assignment 
you've proven yourself and you've finished things on time in a timely manner and you didn't go over budget. If somebody approached you and wanted you to do a custom commission of them or their family members, is that something that you would do? Oh yes, I would. It's just that I'm, I'm booked for about a year so they'd have to be patient. But I would say most great works of art that you can think of, even dating back to the Greco-Roman times, the bust of Caesar Augustus and all of these statues, um, they were commissions of real people. So at, in the olden days, they used to actually sit there like, like for a portrait painting, yes. same with sculpting. Yes. But nowadays, you would just work from a photograph? You would still want the person to appear. For instance, when they do the portrait of, let's say, Queen Elizabeth, she's very busy, her, she's a very important person, but she does sit for the artist or the sculptor. They take a lot of very good pictures from all angles, of course, and then she goes on her way, but they will have her sit from time to time as they're developing the painting or the sculpture to check it for all the details and things. It's not just a likeness of a person that makes a good portrait, it's what the artist imports into it. Especially in formal portraiture, you want to feel like you know that person. You're looking at a portrait and you've never met that person before in your life and you never will, but you want to feel their presence and actually that they're sitting before you and having a conversation that you've gotten to know them. This is one of your most famous statues as well, correct? Because she's a yes. Knoxville person. Yes, Lizzie Crozier French was a very famous Knoxville woman suffragist. And she was fighting for the woman's right to vote. And she had assisted in establishing the first school for women in Knoxville. And, and it was a challenge to do portraiture of her because all we had was literally these historic black and white photographs, which are a little out of focus. And I had to obtain permission from the um, McClung Museum to use them. But they just are not the greatest. But that's what we had. This is probably 1890. 1869 when this period of her life when I sculpted her I did full-size drawings of her with the appropriate type of costuming that they wore back then it's been in a few museums it's been in the East Tennessee History Museum and there's a copy of of this in City Hall as well well you've done an outstanding job well thank you very much now that you've seen a sculptor at work I hope you have a greater appreciation of the time and skill that it takes to make something by hand it takes passion, practice, and time. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Handmade.